All right, we're going to go ahead and read chapter 16 of A Long Walk to Water by Linda Sue Park. Chapter 16, Southern Sudan, 2009. After the excitement of seeing the, that first spray of water, the villagers went back to work. Several men gathered in front of Naya's house. They had tools with them, hoes and spades and skites. Her father went out to meet them, and the men walked together to a spot beyond the second big tree and began clearing the land. Naya watched them for a few moments. Her father saw her and waved. She put the plastic can down and ran over to him. Papa, what are you doing? Clearing the land here, getting ready to build. To build what? Naya's father smiled. Can't you guess? Hmm, that's the end of Naya's part for today. So what do you think they're going to build? All right, let's read Salva's part. Rochester, New York, 1996 through 2003. Salva had been in Rochester for nearly a month and still had not seen a single dirt road. Unlike Southern Sudan, It seemed that here in America, every road was paved, and at times the cars whizzed by so fast he was amazed that anyone on foot could cross safely. His new father, Chris, told him that dirt roads did exist out in the countryside, but there were none in Salva's new neighborhood. All the buildings had electricity. There were white people everywhere. Snow fell from the sky for hours at a time and then stayed on the ground for days. Sometimes it would start to melt during the day, but before it all disappeared, more snow would fall. Salva's new mother, Louise, told him it would probably be April, three more months before the snow went away completely. The first several weeks of Salva's new life were so bewildering that he was grateful for his studies. His lessons, especially English, gave him something to concentrate on. A way to block out the confusion for an hour or two at a time. His new family helped too. All of them were kind to him, patiently explaining the millions of things he had to learn. It had taken four days for Salva to travel from the IFO refugee camp to his new home in New York. There were times when he could hardly believe he was on the same planet. Now that Salva was learning more than a few simple words, he found English language, the English language to be con quite confusing, like the letters. O-U-G-H. Rough, though, fought, through, bow. The same letters were pronounced so many different ways. And how a word that could be changed depending on the sentence. You said chickens when you meant the living birds that walked and squawked and laid eggs. But it was chicken with no S when it was on your plate ready to be eaten. We're having chicken for dinner. That was correct. Even if you had cooked a hundred chickens. Sometimes he wondered if he would ever be able to speak and read English well. But slowly with hours of hard work over the months and years, his English improved. Remembering Michael, Salva also joined a volleyball team. It was fun playing volleyball, just as it had been at the camp. Setting and spiking the ball were the same in any language. Salva had been in Rochester for more than six years now. He was going to college and decided to study business. He had a vague idea that he wanted to, that he would like to return to Sudan someday to help the people who live there. Sometimes that seemed like an impossible notion. In his homeland, there was so much war and destruction, poverty, disease, and starvation, so many problems that had not been solved by governments or rich people or big aid organizations. What could he possibly do to help? Salva thought about this question a lot, but no answer came to him. One evening at the end of a long day of study, Salva sat down at the family computer and opened his email. He was surprised to see a message from a cousin of his, someone he barely knew. The cousin was working for a relief agency in Zimbabwe. Salva clicked open the message. 
His eyes read the words, but at first his brain could not comprehend them. United Nations Clinic, your father, stomach surgery. Salva read the words again and again. Then he jumped to his feet and ran through the house to find Chris and Louise. My father, he shouted. They have found my father. After several exchanges of emails, Salva learned that the cousin had not actually seen or spoken to his father. The clinic where his father was recovering was in a remote part of southern Sudan. There was no telephone or mail service, no way of communicating with the clinic staff. The staff kept lists of all the patients they treated. These lists were submitted to the United Nations aid agencies. Salva's cousin worked for one of the agencies and he had seen the name of Salva's father on the list. Salva immediately began planning to travel to Sudan. But with the war still raging on, it was very difficult to make the arrangements. He had to get permits, fill out dozens of forms, and organize plane flights and car transport in a region where there were no airports or roads. Salva and Chris and Louise as well spent hours on the phone to various agencies and offices. It took not days or weeks, but months before all the plans were in place. And there was no way to get a message to the hospital. At times, Salva felt almost frantic at the delays and frustrations. What if my father leaves the hospital without telling anyone where he is going? What if I get there too late? I will never be able to find him again. At last, all the forms were filled out and all the paperwork was in order. Salva flew in a jet to New York City, another one to Amsterdam, and a third to Kampala in Uganda. In Kampala, it took him two days to get through customs and immigration before he could board a smaller plight, flight, I'm sorry, before he could build, board a smaller plane to go to Juba in southern Sudan. Then he rode in a jeep on dusty dirt roads into the bush. How familiar everything was and yet how different. The unpaved roads, the scrubby bushes and trees, the huts roofed with sticks bound together and everything was just as Salva remembered as if he had only left yesterday. At the same time, the memories of his life in Sudan were very distant. How could memories feel so close and so far away at the same time? After many hours of jolting and bumping along the roads in the Jeep, after nearly a week of exhausting travel, Salva entered the shanty that served as a recovery room at the makeshift hospital. A white woman stood to greet him. Hello, he said. I am looking for a patient named Mawin Dutt. Eric. And that's the end of chapter 16. Sorry. <laughs> um, wow. So Salva has been in Rochester for over six years. And um, he decided to travel to Sudan because his dad is, he heard his dad is there. So what do you think? Do you think he is going to see his dad? Is his dad going to be there? And I also want to know, um, are you surprised that he took the, the, the flight there? Uh, not just the flight, but like made all of these arrangements just to go and find his father. Um, is that something that surprises you? So are you surprised that he did all of that? Because he's definitely putting himself at risk. Remember that. He's still in a war zone. Uh, so are you surprised that he has gone to southern Sudan to find his father? And two, do you think he's going to find his dad? Is his dad there? I'll have to see you next time. <laughs>